Hello, and welcome to After Scientology, Straight Up and Vertical. This is the weekly show where journalist Tony Ortega and I get together, and we go over the events in the world of Scientology as reported on Tony's Substack during the week. Tony, welcome to the show. Hello there, Chris. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you. Um, and glad to have you. And as you can see on the screen there, I'm just going to get this out of the way early, is the address to Tony Substack. And if you are not subscribed to that, I highly recommend you get subscribed to it and you get your daily notifications because Tony puts out sometimes more than one story a day, depending on breaking news. And uh, if you want to have the latest and greatest, that is where you should go. Uh, so that all being said, let's take a look at this last week because, boy, did we have some stuff. Uh, first off, and this was kind of exciting. Uh, we talked last week about Alex, apostate Alex, Alex Barnes-Ross over in the UK and getting some um, some attention and some uh, action with an MP over there. So we talked about that last week. But now this week, Leah chimed in on this. What was this all about? Yeah, you know, um, I checked in with her. I haven't talked to her in a while. And we talked about this story, and she was really excited about it, and she gave me a statement to put out publicly. And that's, uh, you know, I was really happy about that. I don't think I've quoted Leah in a while. And uh, she understands why this is a big deal. Alex Barnes-Ross, who lives in London, uh, wrote a letter to his MP. That would be like you or I writing a letter to our congressman. And explaining the things that had happened to him in Scientology, and he was unhappy about some recent small decisions that have been made in the courts about some incremental changes in the way Scientology is taxed. And he was unhappy about that, and he wanted his MP to look into that and maybe find a way to reverse those changes. Well, she did better than that. Diane Abbott has been in Parliament since 1987. She's a very well-known uh, member of Parliament first black woman ever elected to parliament and she's the longest serving black member of parliament uh she's been you know at the center of a lot of different controversial issues and she's been uh, at, at some of the highest national level government uh positions so this is somebody who's you know a pretty substantial member of the government over there and she told him that she was not only uh interested in having those recent changes looked at she wanted a widespread investigation of Scientology and its history of fraudulent financial activity internationally. And so she told Alex, she has asked the HMRC, uh, yes, HMRC, which is the Britain's version of the IRS, mm -hmm. investigate this. I mean, this is... This is the kind of thing that Leah and Mike have been looking for in this country for years. Can we find a national level politician who will go to the IRS and say, hey, open up an investigation? We don't, you know, we're not asking you to prosecute. We're just asking you to open an investigation, look at this organization. Yeah. And Alex, based on a letter, has managed to do that in England. And so Leah did agree with me. It's a big deal. She wrote me a statement for the for the Substack. I was just really glad to see that uh, people could see that, you know, that Leah's paying attention to this. I think that's a big deal because, you know, she's going through her own major battle, own lawsuit. She really can't talk about that right now. But right. I was grateful to her that she she did want to weigh in on this uh, overseas development. And I think we're all really interested in how that turns out. Absolutely. I have a few comments about this just from my perspective, because I want to say first off that when a, someone at that level, as you've said, right, this national level attention at a government level gets directed at Scientology, this is when OSA freaks out. This is when Scientology, this is when David Miscavige takes notice and goes, wait a minute, what? They're doing what now? Right. Because this is a big, big deal for them because they can't afford to have government attention. This is this is where, you know, pushing back against that kind of attention is a very, very difficult task for Scientology. It's not like just intimidating some critics into silence or, you know, some individual low level bureaucrat or low level, um, you know, person at some private company. When it gets right. to the government level and it gets to the representative level, you are dealing with some trouble. So um, so Alex is also, by the way, 
not just writing letters, but is put together um, as we've gone over, as as he's shown uh, on Tony's blog as well. Uh, statistics, you know, financial information. He's been researching into this for months and that pays off in this kind of thing. And that's what I wanted to highlight for Alex is that that work has been, um, he's been putting a lot, burning a lot of midnight oil. <laughs> well, and it seems like um, it's paying off because he's uh, directing this at people that are re re reacting. I mean, so often over here, it seems like it kind of goes into an ocean, you know, nobody listens yeah. to what, what's being said, but I think in some ways, um, you know, they're the, these politicians that are being asked about it are kind of like, Whoa, what's going on? You know? And, and I, it feels like that his timing is good yeah. and that maybe over there, people are ready to start seeing some interesting stuff happen. So I'm excited about it. Big time. Me too. Maybe this could be the next senator. Senator uh, was that Xenophon down in uh, Australia? Remember that guy? Oh man, talk about somebody who was like going after Scientology at the Australian government level. Um, okay, good. So that was an awesome story. And then also with Leah tied to her lawsuit were some uh, declarations uh, submitted to the court this week from Mike and Claire. Do I have that right? Oh wow, so good, so amazing. Last week, the week before, we talked about how I went to L.A. Yeah. to see the hearings there and uh you know scientology of course is trying to derail leah's uh, lawsuit with a lot of you know motions to strike and anti-slap and this judge hammock i like him he's he is giving scientology some things to take out of her lawsuit but they're minor things that because of timing and and the the some of the issues around defamation but he's leaving in the majority and the most important uh, parts of her lawsuit mm -hmm. but then during a hearing last week robert mangles who's the attorney for rtc which is the highest level scientology entity it's the one david miscavige is the chairman of he stood up and said judge i don't even know why we're here they're, they're not alleging anything against us well that the judge asked leah's attorney about that and that was a bit of a problem because she was alleging all these, you know, these the smears they've been throwing at her day and night on the internet, private investigators showing up and intimidating her family, but they weren't specifically saying RTC did this, RTC did That's this. That's right. And so the judge explained at this early level, all you need to do is allege it. You don't have to prove anything yet. That comes later. That's what a trial is for, right? Yeah. Right now, you just need to allege it. And they didn't seem to be alleging RTC's role in all this even though you and i and everybody else knows that none of this kind of harassment of leah remini or 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 mike rinder or you or me none of that happens without david miscavige is overseeing it right that's right but you got to say it you got to say you got to spell it out and they had not spelled it out the yep. judge then gave them time to add a declaration from mike rinder and of course, Scientology was all angry about that and said, that's not what the anti-slap is about. You shouldn't be extending this. But I like this judge. He said, no, this, this, this makes sense. So this week, declarations came in from both Mike Rinder and Claire Headley, where they spelled out in amazing detail how David Miscavige and RTC are constantly being given reports about people they consider enemies. They're the ones sending out the troops, the OSA troops, to do these operations against people. They've got specific examples. And of course, with Mike, you know, he's just got his own personal experience seeing this happening. So uh, my comment was not only did they knock it out of the park with these uh, declarations, and I, I don't think there's any question they're going to be able to keep RTC in Leah's lawsuit. That's the immediate concern. But these documents are going to be so useful to other people in their lawsuits going forward. I mean, this is just beautiful. It just spells out the retaliation machine in Scientology and how it's all being run by David Miscavige out of the Religious Technology Center. So nice. just really brilliant stuff. I really enjoyed it. I put the whole, I put the whole things up, you know, the entire <laughs> uh declarations. I don't, I don't excerpt it or anything. No, it was great. And it really does lay out the whole uh, anatomy of the of the bully operation, you know, which is really what this whole thing is about. You have uh, 
you know, at the at the at the end of the day, it's really interesting how you really can kind of break Scientology down into two basic things, which is, you know, sucking up as much money as it possibly can, as Hubbard says, with a high powered vacuum. And anyone who gets in the way or says, hey, don't do that. You got some bully standing there just, you know, punch in the face. And that's that's OSA. Yep. And that's Scientology, basically. You know, anyway, uh, good. So that was that was really great. That's moving that lawsuit forward. What's our what is our next step on that now? Where okay. are we? At? Right. So so uh, they will be back in court on February 6th, which mm -hmm. is uh, Tuesday, a week from a week from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they have this week, they have they have to give Scientology some time to respond to Mike and Claire's declarations. And that'll be funny. Huh. Uh, and then they'll be back in court on Tuesday the 6th. They got a lot of stuff. I don't know if they're going to get it all done in one day because not only do they have to deal with this issue about RTC complaining about being in the lawsuit, but then they have to go back to the in individual uh, allegations of defamation that Scientology wanted some of these things pulled out. and The judge was going to look at them. Uh, and then there was also... Um, I think there was another issue. I can't remember right off the top of my head, but but they've got numerous things they've got to get through uh, on that date, and I don't know if they'll get it done on all on that date or not. But it's okay. it's still very early in this lawsuit. Yep. Uh, I think it's important that Leah, you know, has survived the derailing attempt by Scientology. Yep. Uh, the judge is going to keep in the most important things, and I like this judge. I think he's fair to both sides, and. Uh, he, he seems to keep his eye on the big picture. Exactly. And he has, the, the, what I've seen so far um, is he's curious. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good quality for yeah, a He case. cares about this case. He really yeah. does. And he's worked very yeah. hard on it. So I, I think right. Leah's got about as good a person as she can hope for at this point. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay. Now you had an interesting uh, podcast with a blast from the past, uh, and I wanted to hear about this. Uh, Dennis Ehrlich, who, who is this person? Oh, this my. is a name that people need to know. So I, that's oh. why I want to bring this up. You know, Dennis is a legend, and yeah. I, I felt bad that I haven't really spent much time talking to him. And uh, we, you know, we communicate a little bit through Facebook and that kind of thing. And then uh, when I went to that first hearing on uh, Tuesday the sixteenth. Uh, and I announced that I was in LA and I'm going to go to court. I got this message from Dennis saying, "Let's let's get together." I couldn't believe it. Um, so a couple, you know, I don't know, it was later that day or later in the week. We got together, had lunch, and you know, for those people that don't know the name, the reason why Dennis Ehrlich is so important in Scientology history, he was the chief cramming officer at Flag at one point. Um, he had differences with the management and got declared and left mm -hmm. and kind of ripped his family apart. Um, he endured a lot of stuff, but what's important is ARS had started in 1991, but by the late 94, it was still, you know, Scientologists, ex-Scientologists kind of debating and not too serious. And then Dennis showed up and he started really arguing with ex-Scientologists saying you're lying. I mean, with current Scientologists saying you're lying. You're not, you're not explaining how Scientology actually works. You're, you know, and he, he took out the green volumes and started ripping pages out and just posting them saying, see, this is what actually goes on in Scientology. Well, this was the early internet. I mean, we're talking early, late 1994, early 1995. Message board. Very, it was the Usenet. And yeah. uh, a alt religious Scientology and Scientology freaked out. They they were like, we can't have people discussing our secret policies publicly. Mm -hmm. We have this is a violation of our trademark copyright. They went into court and see the courts. This was you know it's really important that this happened. It's sad, but it's important that it happened because Scientology actually convinced a court that Dennis Ehrlich was violating their copyrights and trademarks they went down to his house with cops yep. seized his computers which he has never gotten back and started this massive fight and and that was february 1995 later in the year other people were raided in the united states and in europe 
And this became Scientology's big fight was they were going to keep this internet thing from becoming this nightmare for them. And all they did was got all these geeks interested who had never even heard of Scientology. Yeah. All of these computer nerds were like, wait a minute, who's trying to shut down our internet? You know, yeah. and it began this massive, massive war, which turned out to be a disaster for Scientology. So Dennis Erlich was right at the beginning of all that. Um, and he was written about extensively back then. But then, you know, I, I got to, you know, I noticed that, recently he'd been through a life change he almost died with a seizure oh, wow. and he came out of it you know talking differently it was it seemed like a different dentist and i was really curious about this mm -hmm. and then he told me that actually there have been three major turning points in his life and he started telling me about november 1966 when the 60s became the 60s Dennis Ehrlich was right there. And they, we were talking about the Sunset Strip riots, which happened in November 1966. There was this nightclub that was being shut down. A lot of people showed up, including Jack Nicholson and Peter Fonda. And Dennis Ehrlich got out his guitar out and was on the steps of this club and started playing. People gathered. The cops didn't like it. And it started this massive riot that lasted like you know, weeks in different forms. Wow. And, and numerous people have said that this, this was it. This was the real first major battle in the counterculture war that became the sixties. Um, so, you know, Dennis and I have talked about that, about how here he was the man on the scene for this major shift in our culture in the sixties. And he was the man on the scene in this major shift in our internet culture in the nineties. And yeah. now he's gone through this transformation because of this health scare. And he, it's really caused him to reassess his life, reassess the way he thinks about living. And I remember I was seeing him on the internet saying on Facebook saying, listen, I've been through this thing. We may be friends, but I may need to meet you again and and learn who you are again. And I was just like, wow. So wow. it was one it was wonderful to actually sit down with him. We had a very nice lunch, and then we did the the podcast later. And uh, I just I just think he's an amazing guy that's been through so much incredible stuff, and now he's got this wonderful, loving sort of outlook on life, and he's helping other people leave organizations like Scientology. So what what a what a great guy. I'm so happy that I finally got to do this. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. And that is significant Scientology history. It's actually sort of the pre-anonymous anonymous. That's right. Actually. And except that it, it was except back then in 95 it was individuals. It was it was exactly. Corinne Spank in the Netherlands. Uh there's a guy in Sweden, uh Arnie Lerna, Arnie Lerma in uh DC. Um, and that, that all came later. It was Dennis who was the first one who was raided, I believe, in February yeah. 1995. And he had legal issues for years after that. And Scientology was trying to destroy him. Exactly. So, you know, exactly. it, it was just a few individuals taking on Scientology and, and, and it was, became this major battle over the early Internet. And, uh, you know, I think we all owe him a debt of gratitude that we can all talk freely about Scientology and its policies and show copies of their things. And, and nobody's no cops are going to come breaking down our doors. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, thank you, Dennis Erland. Big time, big time. I got I need to say that on Friday, this last Friday in my live stream, I talked about how all the work that I have done over the years um, has been on the shoulders of giants that I have that I that I am not amongst that class of people that I have benefited from all the work of all the hardcore heroes who came before. Dennis Ehrlich is exactly the kind of person I was talking about. You know, I mentioned uh, Walsham, I mentioned John Atack, I mentioned some other names. Dennis is amongst those. These people took shellackings none of us would want to have in our life. Uh, for years, and they were alone in that. They were isolated, and it was there was no internet. There was, you know, there was not really that not like there is now. There was no YouTube. Yeah, none of that just imagine Chris, if you know, if if Kendrick Moxon showed up at your house demanding to come inside, you'd say no, get out of here. Right. But if it was you know a police officer, it was three or four police officers armed, saying we need to come in. 
you know, it's a completely different ball game. And it's just amazing that Scientology was able to convince the courts at that time to do that for them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't do that today, but. Yeah. No, no. They, and they were actually with the police busted yeah. into the guy's house. Yeah. Scientology. Right. You know? Like it was, it, the I mean, police were standing there as Warren McShane was picking up Dennis's computer and taking it away. Exactly. Incredible. That, unbelievable. Right. So, yeah, when we say those people took some shellackings, we're not kidding. Yeah. Um, okay. So good on him. And um, now talk about people taking some shellackings. So Masterson, <laughs> this fucking guy. So, okay. So he, he you know, he pays, puts out this Hail Mary, I guess, his lawyers, his new lawyers put in this this appeal or this this document. Hey, he should be released uh, while, he's, while his appeal goes through. What happened here? Right. Well, when we talked earlier, Chris, remember, we were talking about how, OK, he's got these expensive new lawyers. They're trying, you know, to they're trying some fancy footwork. Um, there were two main things about his. It was a motion for bail while he's on appeal. And there were two main parts to it. The one was he's a great guy and he's been he's kept his nose clean since 2003. OK, that's you know, he's got a community. He's got family, friends, you know. Uh, the other one was. Uh, yet again, an attempt to argue that the that the statute of limitations is a problem here, and you, you the enhancement, blah blah blah. I I posted the whole thing mainly because I wanted people to see the attorneys talking about what a great guy Danny Masterson is. Mm -hmm. But I went ahead and posted all the legal argument too. But it was impenetrable. I mean, it was just like, are you guys serious? You think you think this is going to fly with Judge Olmedo? Right. So Judge Charlene Omedo, uh last week had a hearing and she had this like 12 or 13 page ruling. I just posted the whole ruling. It's just a thing of beauty yeah. um, because, you know, OK, he's got a community to go home to. Well, his wife is divorcing him. So, he, no, he doesn't have her to go home to. Boom. You know, because some of us think that possibly they're breaking up simply to protect assets. Well, there's a price to pay. You know, he doesn't have, uh, you can't argue that he's got this wife to go home to. Uh, mm -hmm. Another thing was, um, you know, that he's been, he's been a law abiding citizen since 2003, since these, you know, incidents. Uh, Judge Olmedo was like, oh yeah, well then how come I couldn't get him to turn in his guns, right? And so once again, this whole thing where they're probably being sloppy or who knows, whatever, but you know, they just haven't accounted for all of his guns. Mm -hmm. That pays a price with Judge Olmedo. She's not messing around. So yep. she really kind of made them look stupid. Um, and, but my favorite thing was, as far as that impenetrable legal argument about statute of limitations and enhancements, she just said, no, this isn't the proper time for that, and just ignored it. I was so happy because I was worried I have to have to read like page after page of her citing case law. and you know. But no, yeah. she just said, nah, forget it. You can't do that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so no, he's not going anywhere while they appeal. And uh, it's, you know, I I was really expecting now. Now, this is not his appeal. This is just a motion for right. bail. Right. But apparently these are his appellate attorneys. These are the guys that are going to be handling it. And I, I thought that, you know, what you do in an appeal is you try to prove to the appeals court that the judge messed up. And mm -hmm. so I figured they'd be focusing on her ruling about Scientology, how much Scientology to allow in, uh, the fact that they got to mention drugging more in the second trial. Uh, and that may still be the case, but I didn't expect them to be like, Danny's a great guy and uh, he shouldn't have been tried this way. I mean, it's just, that just seems very weak. Um, yeah. And you know, he's paying top dollar. So, but we don't know yet. It'll be some time yet before we see his actual appeal at the appellate court. The appeals court does have the, have the, have the full record that, that we got a notification about that, but um We'll see, uh, but he's going to sit tight while they work on that. Exactly. He ain't going anywhere. Sorry, Danny. Going to be staying put for a little while. Uh, long, good while. Um, I wonder, I'm just sitting here wondering right now. It's probably not even an important question, but just, you know, I, I, I doubt Miscavige has his finger on the pulse of this appeals process the way he does on the rest of the case up to then you know what i mean i wonder if they've just cut that whole thing loose uh declared or not you know what i mean we still don't really have a definitive answer on any of that but uh anyway i guess we'll have to see how this whole thing yeah, plays i would just out. caution people to keep in mind that it's the daily mail telling everyone that danny's been declared and that 
right. Bijou has left. And it's just, you know, we don't have any kind of confirmation of that. And it's the Daily Mail that was telling you last year that Tom Cruise had left Scientology. And exactly. they were absolutely completely wrong about that. Uh, right. I'm not I'm not saying that that I know either you know either one of those situations with Danny or Bijou. I just I just don't have the information yet. So I would just caution you to believe that that the Daily Mail has solved that situation. Yeah, exactly. This is one of those things where it's important enough that we're going to want multiple confirmations from multiple sources kind of thing, just like we did with the RPF thing. We knew all the way back in 20, I think 15, it was it was canceled. But we didn't really nail it down and say, absolutely, that's the case until like 18 or 19 when we had about three or four different verifications of that. Anyway, moving along, last thing here, and, and most interesting, I am like, what is this? And I kind of missed the significance of it at first when it was first coming out myself. I was like, okay, well, that's interesting, but so what? Shelly Miscavige, voter registration, this comes out. What? What? So what are we looking at with this now? Where Shelly right. to? Right. So Mark and Claire Headley earlier this week were talking about this voter registration. Uh, uh, it was kind of a so sort of a screen grab, I think, that showed up at Reddit originally, suggesting that Shelley Miscavige in 2017 was registered to vote at the address, which is the Church of Science, Spiritual Technologies, Petrolia, California, vault location. Now, for those who don't know, we believe that in 2000, the su late summer, early fall, 2005, Dave banished his wife, Shelly Miscavige, to the headquarters compound of the Church of Spiritual Technology, CST, which is the most secretive of all Scientology's entities. Most Scientologists have no idea what it is. Most Scientologists have no idea where, the, where these locations are. Uh, very few people have ever been to them. They op the CST operates vaults, three in California and one in New Mexico, where they store copies of L. Ron Hubbard's materials on, on media that's designed to last thousands of years so that when there's some kind of civilization collapse, uh, Dianetics will emerge, right? Um, this is, it's ridiculous, okay? But they have these uh, elaborate, I mean, they have these vaults. They're pretty simple, actually. Very simple vaults. And then... Uh, the CST headquarters in uh, in a, it's near a little hamlet called Twin Peaks, California. So we usually refer to it as Twin Peaks. It's up in the San Bernardino Mountains, and Shelley was there for years and years. And and I have multiple lines of evidence on that. I have public records on that. But and the reason why I I never thought they'd move her to the other locations is that it's the CST at Twin Peaks where they've actually got several buildings. They've got maybe twelve or fifteen people. They do the work. Of, of preserving our Hubbard's archival words. They actually create the laser discs and all that. That work is done there. And so the idea is that Shelly would be, be kept, kept there so that there's people to keep an eye on her and she'd have something to do. Right. If you go to the other locations like Trementina in New Mexico or Petrolia in far Northern California, there's just like two buildings, a vault and maybe two people. How do you send Shelly there? I just, I never even... I was very skeptical, so I never looked into it. Well, it turns out that this voter registration turns up that suggests that about 2017, she went up there. Now, the news I have for you this week, Chris, is I spent mm -hmm. a lot of work this week, and I did manage to independently confirm that Shelly Miscavige is currently registered to vote at that address in Petrolia, California. She has not voted since the 90s. I don't think she, she probably, what happened was they moved her up there she got a new driver's license and they had a motor voter thing up there and it automatically uh, enrolled her to vote. Yep. Um, and that's probably what happened. So, but it is true. This is the Shelly Miscavige, not somebody with a similar name. It is her. She's registered at that address for the Petrolia vault, uh, which is so isolated. And there may be a two or three or four people there. Yep. Um, so remote miles and miles just to get to the main road so uh you know i just think it's so grim that dave was probably getting very paranoid that 2015 2016 we had a sighting of shelly and crestline a possible sighting um i had been up there with australian you know 60 minutes we were writing about hey this is where shelly is and i guess dave was like i can't keep her there anymore sent right. her up to petrolia yeah so that's pretty grim uh, we don't, you know, I can't say for certainty that she's there today, 
I just know that she's registered. She has registered to vote there. Right. But, you know, it does raise a lot of questions about, you know, um, I was very frustrated when she was at Twin Peaks because some of her family members came to me and asked to do a welfare check. And they said they were having problems with the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office. So I wrote to the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office and they totally blew me off. But maybe the Humboldt County Sheriff's Department is a different story. Maybe they're not safe pointed by the church of scientology i don't know but it raises a lot of interesting possibilities and uh um i don't know i i i saw one person one person comment on my story about this saying well why why should we care about her i'm like are you kidding me the leader of an international multi-billion dollar religious organization is basically allowed to make his wife disappear for the last 18 and a half years and there's no consequences for him. Right. Come on, think about this. I mean, I do care. I, I do think that Shelly deserves to be able to come out and see her family once in a while. Um, why can't she see her family on holidays and stuff? You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. She's a prisoner. She is a prisoner and David Miscavige should not be allowed to get away with that. Nope. And this should this should be part of what convinces the government to take a harder look at David Miscavige and the Church of Scientology. That's why it's important. That's right. That's exactly right. Do we have um because you featured some drone footage um of these various locations that the, the of CST, these places, Twin Peaks, et cetera. I think there's a place down in New Mexico as well, right? Trementia. Um, yeah. Trementia. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, do we have drone footage of this place? This, this, yeah. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And my story, if you look at my sub stack earlier this week, I reposted those. Oh. If, it's interesting. It's interesting because the drone, that, that drone footage was made in 2016. So maybe right around the time that they were, and we noticed there was construction going on outside the vault itself. The vault in petroleum, see with uh, Twin Peaks, the vault and all these buildings where they do that work are all in this, all very tightly together. Yeah. Petrolia, the vault is like two miles from any other buildings. You know, then they've got each one of these places has what they call an LRH house, which is this elaborate mansion waiting for L. Ron Hubbard if he ever comes back. Right. And I don't, you know, I'm sure it would be nice if Shelly got to stay in there, but is David Miscavige? going to allow Shelly to use Hubbard's house? I, I don't know. I think she's I doubt it. It's going to be the sort of thing. What I'm thinking is if this is if this is where she's located, it's maintenance. <laughs> it's cleaning upon cleaning. I don't know that people generally appreciate. So let me just say to everybody here how crazy about cleaning the Sea Org is. Like fanatical, like white gloves you know over the dust and if anything comes up you got to clean it all over again it's like that this well, is yeah, mark, mark headley is that's the one of those facilities he's actually been to oh. and he was describing it to me and he was saying yeah that's the problem with with those i mean yeah the cst headquarters there's lots of stuff to do because they're you know creating these discs and stuff but yeah. up at trementina in new mexico or petrolia northern california he said it's just a don't mess up assignment let don't let the grass grow too long don't let the pipes freeze yep i mean you know i hope they have a decent tv or something because i don't know what they're gonna do up there yeah read you know depending on hubbard, how many yeah play. read hubbard maybe that's right that's right i mean i'll tell you um you know three years on the rpf the 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 entertainment we had was the tech films oh and those PSAs, those public service announcements for the way to happiness and 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 those things. Yeah, it was like that. It's not guys, I mean, I'm sitting here, you know, trying to make light of this, but it's it's this is we're talking about human trafficking. We're talking about labor trafficking. We're talking about kind of the worst of the worst of how things get with these cults. And disappearing, you know, the leader's wife, as Tony was just going over, is no small thing. Um and and we really don't know. That's kind of the problem is we know what Scientology is capable of. So what could be going on up there? Who knows? But it it's never going to be good. Um, so I'm glad at least that we have that much more information. This was clearly not meant to leak. And Miscavige definitely wants her out of the picture. And this is kind of the sort of thing just short of, I guess, sending her out to the outback in Australia. I mean, 
in terms of disappearing her, this is about as effective of a remote location as you can get in the Scientology world. So we're, you know, as far as remote sightings, that kind of thing. I don't know. I guess we'll have to see what happens here. But that welfare check's a good idea. Yeah, I wish those cousins would call me again. Hello, call me again. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, well, that's our latest and greatest right now, folks. That's uh, that's what's kind of happening right now. So, uh, Tony, any previews of anything you want to drop for this week? Uh, more stuff in courts going on. And I, I think uh, you'll see some interesting stuff about that. All right, cool. All right, good. Uh, well, with that, um, thank you very much for coming around and watching us gabber on about all of this. We really appreciate your viewership and your support. And uh, we hope that you are getting something out of our weekly shows. And of course, I'll remind you again, subscribe to Tony's Substack. It's right there on the screen. Get your daily notifications. We'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.